In this video, we're covering the supervisory implications of an evidence-based approach that's gone by various names. These include measurement-based care, feedback-informed treatment, and, and the term we're going to use here, which is routine outcome monitoring. But regardless of what it's called, it's a process that involves first valuing, then obtaining, and then using the client's perspective in treatment. And more specifically, what it involves is having the client fill out session by session a measure of their level of psychosocial functioning as well as their perception of the alliance with their therapist. In some ways, it's analogous to having your vital signs checked by your physician when you come into the office. And this proved invaluable on a number of fronts, but particularly so for working with clients who are not making expected progress or even deteriorating. And the fact is, as much as we clinicians would like to believe that we're able to identify those clients, that's just not the case. In one especially sobering study, but not one that's atypical, Hannon et al. asked therapists to identify clients who were leaving treatment less well off than when they began. Those therapists were able to identify only one in 40 of those clients, 2.5%. So having a measure that's actually able to make those predictions is invaluable. And in fact, the research on routine outcome monitoring, comparing it to treatment as usual, shows us that first, routine outcome monitoring results in robustly improved client outcomes, significantly decreased rates of client dropouts, and, and perhaps as important as both of the above, it really enacts a value that most therapists adhere to, which, which is involving the client as a collaborator in treatment. For some of you, this will be a new concept, or at least one you're only vaguely familiar with. So we prevailed upon our colleague, Heidi Zetzer, to talk about her clinic and how she uses routine outcome monitoring, how she decided its value added, and how she uses it in both therapy and supervision. I'm really pleased that we have Heidi Zetzer, who's part of our training team with us today. Heidi's at UC Santa Barbara, where she's on the faculty, but also she runs the training clinic there. And she's also president of the Association of Psychology Training Clinics. Let me say that I have been the director of a training clinic for 14 years. And right away, I thought about using routine outcome monitoring, mostly because across the country, most of the training clinics were already using it. So uh, in, through my involvement with the Association of Psychology Training Clinics, it was clear that especially for training purposes, this is really a very helpful tool, uh, most particularly because it gives the client more of a voice and more of a presence in supervision, and it mm -hmm. helps drive our attention towards increased effectiveness. How does this get structured into the day-to-day -day fabric of the clinic and, and in your, the supervision you offer? So let me talk about it from two different points, or maybe three actually. So first, as the director, I made a decision to implement routine outcome monitoring, and that's really critical to have top-down buy-in. We have to show that we're effective at what we do, rather than just the number of clients served. So secondly, we start by including the routine outcome monitoring in our informed consent process. So they know right away that they're gonna to have to come in a little bit early and fill out some assessments. And then also right before the end of the session, they're gonna fill out a very brief assessment and talk about how helpful that session was to them at that time. The other thing that clients get is uh, throughout the course of treatment, there might be moments where the will bring in a graph of the client's progress so they can get a sense of their accomplishments. Or at the end of therapy, you can really show the trajectory of growth over time. So there are, there are benefits to the client. There are tremendous benefits to the clinician because it, this amplifies or illuminates the client's experience of therapy and how they are benefiting from it throughout the course of treatment. But more critically, routine outcome monitoring is really good at identifying people who are at risk for deterioration. So one thing that's helpful is using measures that have some psychometric validity and reliability, and they give us a clear picture of how well the client is doing based on their report to the clinician. And they also give us a sense of how the client is perceiving the therapist and the therapeutic alliance. I know there's a number of different feedback 
measures out there. Which ones have you chosen? We went with a measure that is really efficient, really simple, easy to use. That's called the Partners for Change Outcome Management System. It might also be referred to as My Outcomes, uh, which is the automated version. So PCOMS has two components. One is the outcome rating scale, and the other is the session rating scale. The outcome scale is a measure of how the client is doing. And it's very, very simple. It's four lines, four 10 centimeter lines with how well things are going for them uh, individually, how well things are going for them in their intimate relationships, how well things are going for them socially, and then just sort of a general rating of how things are going. And they just mark whoosh, whoosh, like that on this 10 centimeter line. And then the therapist takes out a, a metric ruler that's about this big and measures it and then adds up the numbers. And that's the score for how the client is doing at that session or actually the, in the week prior to the session. So very simple. That's the outcome rating scale. The ORS, they fill out in the waiting room before the session. And this, then the therapist takes a look at it. Uh, before going into the session with the client so they can see what it may be some challenging areas in the mm -hmm. client's life. And one benefit of this is that it helps focus the session. So you're not just talking about what happened last week. The clinician will just sit right down with the client and take a look at it and they'll talk, they'll talk about the score. They'll talk about where the challenges are for them from the last week and not just what happened, but what's really presenting some barriers to growth or change for the client. I, I do wanna say that some training and preparation is required to use this system because there is often apprehension on the part of the therapist, more so perhaps than the client. The SRS is the session rating scale. And one of the things that we know from the literature is that when clients are not improving, it's one of two things. It's either that the therapy that's being offered isn't quite on the mark, right? So it's a treatment issue. But it's more often the case that there is some disruption, perhaps a rupture in the therapeutic alliance. And the SRS measures the strength of the therapeutic relationship. And it's how well, under, it's again, four 10 centimeter lines, how well understood the client feels. Uh, is there agreement on goals and tasks uh, for therapy? And this is all really tied to just that one session, um, but goals and tasks. Then also, is the approach that the clinician or the therapist is taking resonating with the client? So they'll rate the approach or goals. And then lastly is how is the session going? How did the session go? How, it's kind of like the temperature, taking the temperature of the relationship. And this is really an opportunity for some immediacy because clients, the literature against this, clients don't disclose how they feel about their therapist or the process of therapy to the therapist. And therapists are not good at detecting it. Mm -hmm. So while both parties may have some apprehension about this, the client learns that each and every week, they're going to have a chance to fill out the SRS and to say something about how things are going. Do they do that in the room? I'm sorry to be so concrete here, but I, this is new to a lot of people. No, no, it's great to be concrete about it because you want to get a clear picture of what it's going to look like, right? It happens right in the room. And in our clinic, we use, we're on paper and pencil for these measures. And Five minutes before the session is over, the therapist hands the client the SRS and they mark on it. And the therapist adds up the measures. The higher the, the, higher the rating, the better the relationship. <clears throat> this is really an opportunity to have a, uh, a thoughtful, some thoughtful moments about the therapeutic relationship. Uh, and Especially, I think there's great, tremendous value here in terms of multicultural attunement in particular, because ah. it could be the therapist might be sensing something. If they're lucky, they've sensed something. <laughs> and some change in the ratings might then invite the client to say something. Because of the power dynamics, it's very hard for this all to happen spontaneously, right? The client's in a vulnerable position. 
So it's really critical that the therapist communicate to the client that they want to know what their experience of therapy is. And it's not like a grade or a rating of the therapist's character. It's really how well are we working together. So that's how it looks in therapy. How, how do you use it in supervision then? I think that supervisors take different approaches and talk about what I do um, and what we do in a clinic. And uh, we ask the therapists to graph the ratings of the ORS and the SRS in an Excel file. Uh, and you can also do it on paper. So like you just make a little graph and reproduce a bunch of those and then they can just write right on the graph uh, and then bring that to supervision. So we can see the trajectory of the client's uh, progress, right? And especially to identify those folks who are struggling and aren't making improvements. I, I know you've got a slide that we're going to show here in the video that uh, a supervisee brought in about a, a client, actually a couple of slides. Would you talk about those to really illustrate how this has worked in this particular case with the supervisee? Uh, okay, this case example, I think, shows the value of using the PCOMS uh, system, so or the ORS and the SRS. And if you take a look at the ORS total, you can see that the client is reporting very low levels of well-being. Uh, 25 is the cutoff for the ORS, and that's when you're adding up those four lines, measuring the 10 centimeters and adding it up. And uh, clients who score a total that is below 25 are very similar to clients who are in outpatient therapy. So a goal of therapy itself is getting a client's sense of well-being up over that 25 in a consistent way. And you can see that this client is really struggling. Um, she is a 30 something Asian American client working with a similar background, 30 something uh, Asian American male therapist. And uh, she was, had left a highly conflictual relationship where there was a, a lot of volatility. Uh, and the person, her partner had pretty much exploited her and borrowed money from her. And she was working in therapy, trying to decide whether or not to confront him and get it back. The result of her financial rockiness was that she had a very unstable living situation and a lot of frustration and a difficult time managing her emotions. And so the supervisee and I uh, were a little bit uh, perplexed or troubled by how to be helpful to her. This is a very strong therapist, a good uh, therapeutic alliance with the client, uh, it, except when we go to the SRS, you will see that there's a little more to the story. So when we look at the session rating scale, again, that's a cumulative measure of the therapeutic alliance. We can see that it is between 30 and like 36. And again, we wanna be 36 and higher generally. Now, the thing that's important about this is that the supervisor, which was myself, uh, I became concerned that the client was going to confront her ex and perhaps be subject to some violence. And for some reason, I was really, really, really worried about that. And so I instructed the therapist to work with her to create a safety plan. And that happened around session four. So as you can see on the SRS total, that's where the dip is. And that's where things did not go well at all. So she wasn't doing well in terms of the ORS. And then I made this suggestion of an intervention and then that disrupted the therapeutic relationship. It actually fostered a rupture, which I didn't understand. It took another session for me actually to figure out what the problem was. And I encouraged therapist to apologize and repair that rupture. That happened at session six. So if we go back again to the ORS, we can see that over time, this client did get better. And I think that this data sh really represents our experience, which this was really a pretty challenging case. And despite the supervisor's um, miss 
direction, the therapist was able to remedy things. So at least the therapeutic relationship was repaired and there was some improvement over time. I don't think that it's focal in every supervision session. And, but I have found it to be particularly useful when supervisees are struggling or they're particularly challenging clients because it gives us more information and allows us to disentangle some of the ongoing issues for the client and also to pay attention to different aspects of the therapeutic relationship. So it could be that the client feels understood, but your approach is not really resonating with them. Or it could be it's the right approach, but they don't feel understood. So, and sometimes we don't know those things until we use these tools to have that conversation. The ORS and the SRS can signal to the therapist and the supervisor when things are going well or things are not going well, things are going awry. So the client's not improving or there's some sort of therapeutic rupture, but you don't know why until you look at the video and you engage in a dialogue with the supervisee about what might be happening. And that's where your case conceptualization, your theoretical approach, the evidence-based therapy that you're using really comes into play. You know, patient feedback, there's a lot of research on it. It's as effective as say using an SSRI, right? Or more so. Some of those effect sizes are greater than if the client went on some medication as an adjunct to therapy. So I, I just think it's such a simple and interpersonally rich way to enhance therapy and, and generate some improvement over time. Um, therapists also, I think a lot of people enter this field because they're um, thoughtful and sensitive and want to be liked and uh, want to communicate liking. So they get a little anxious about addressing the quality of the therapeutic relationship so directly. Uh, and the way to overcome that is to practice that and to provide the therapist with some scripts for what to say. And so uh, it, at UC Santa Barbara, when I train our first year students, we start right out with this. So they get, they habituate to inviting the client to complete the ORS and the SRS. So they have done this a number of times with practice clients or with each other so that they get over some of their concern about it. Uh, it's been interesting because though we started using this approach in a training clinic, some of the students took it to their practicum sites. And so then those agencies picked up using the RS and the SRS. Some of the schools have done that because it's just so easy. And it provides some outcome data that then you can use and leverage to get additional resources or show your values. So it's a pretty simple way to enhance all the different aspects of the work that you're doing. So the, the work the agency is doing, the supervisor is doing, the therapist is doing, and then the client gets to see their improvement. And that's what it's all about, right? Well, thank you, Heidi. This has been really helpful. Great. Glad to be here, Rob. Let's imagine that your supervisee has brought you ORS and SRS data for the following two cases. What did those data tell you about the client and his or her experience? What did they suggest that you might do with your supervisee? I want to add a little bit more about measures. Dr. Zetzer discussed the ORS and SRS, which are part of the PCOM system. The measure that started this all, though, was Michael Lambert's OQ45. That's the OQ stands for Outcome Questionnaire and the 45 for the 45 items it has. That system and the PCOM systems are the two most widely used and researched. In fact, they're the only two endorsed in SAMHSA's National Registry of Evidence-Based Practice. But there are many other such measures. I would like to return a little bit more to the ORS and SRS before we move on and make a few points. First, when you get a license to it, you'll have access to it in many languages. Second, note that they're available for different age ranges, including for children and including for very young children. So it, instead of words, it has smiley face, frowny face, et cetera, for the children to check. So it's a pretty versatile sort of measure. Also, Dr. Zetzer alluded to the multicultural uses 
of especially the SRS. So let me add one more elaboration of that, and that is that Swift et al. published an article in which they pointed out how a supervisor can work with the supervisee to examine the pattern of their scores with clients across different diversity categories. This uses an Excel spreadsheet. So for example, when the supervisee examines those scores, he or she might find that the scores are routinely better for a particular group or ethnicity and so on, which then becomes a signal for more work with the supervisor to consider what issues might be undergirding that. The thesis of this video has been that the use of routine outcome monitoring is so valuable and the data really support this, that it's increasingly understood as a best practice. And yet the data show that its use is still far from widespread. One study found that indeed, most therapists do regard routine outcome monitoring positively, but that the likelihood of using it was higher for therapists who were A, younger, B, who were more CBT oriented, which is curious because it's really a theoretical, and C, whose agencies mandated that they do so. And I think that's really kind of a, a crucial point, that unless the agency has embraced this as part of their culture of, of evidence-based practice, it's just it's probably not going to happen. And even the agencies that do embrace it and, and systematically collect client data do not necessarily have mechanisms to ensure that the therapists use the data. And so we wanted to conclude this video then by having a conversation with Dr. Robbie Babbins Wagner, who directs the Calgary Counseling Center, which has done extraordinary work with this. What we don't have time to get into in this video are the data that shows that even though therapists believe they get better as they have more experience, that's simply not the case, at least not for the average therapist. There are some exceptions, but for the average therapist, there's really no improvement in outcomes across time. And at least one study shows even a modest decline across time. Again, uh, even though the therapists believe they're getting better. One exception to that though, is a study of the Calgary Counseling Center that Dr. Babbins Wagner directs, and it found that those therapists actually did improve in effectiveness across time, largely because they were using routine outcome monitoring coupled with consultation. And so I'm delighted that we're able to end this video with an interview with her so she can talk about the processes they went through to make that happen. I'm delighted to have with us Dr. Babbins Wagner, who's director of the Calgary Counseling Center. And as I've already mentioned, they've done extraordinary things with using routine outcome monitoring. So Robbie, would you introduce us to the Counseling Center and then talk about how it is you've accomplished what you have with respect to routine outcome monitoring? Calgary Counseling Center is a community-based nonprofit or a charity in uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Calgary is Canada's fourth largest city. We're an energy related city. So oil and gas really drives a lot of what keeps this city going as well as uh, tech innovation. The center sees folks from all over our region. For people that don't know Calgary, we're three hours from the Montana border and we're just an hour east of the Canadian Rockies. When people come to seek our services for a range of specialized services that may not be available in their communities. So we see everybody. We don't have any real restrictions on who can seek our services. They just have to have a problem. But last year we we um, did about 11,232 intakes, which was a growth of about 17% from the year before. So let me go back a bit, probably 20 years, because had we had this conversation 20 years ago, it would be very different. I wasn't interested in research. I wasn't interested in outcomes. I was the kind of grad student that did everything possible not to take research and stats. And I became interested in this kind of inadvertently because um, I had to do an evaluation of a project. The funder wouldn't fund that, and I had to go back and learn how to do this. I was teaching at University of Calgary at the time in the Faculty of Social Work, and I said to my peers, who wants to teach me how to do this? And became really interested in the story that the numbers could tell as a parallel to what, to the client stories. And, um, 
Then one day, a colleague of mine told me I needed to read this book. And the book was The Heroic Client. And I just felt that book spoke to everything that I was thinking about in terms of my career, the work that I was doing clinically at that point in time. And um, I went to a conference that the authors put on in Toronto and came back higher than a kite, wanting to read everything that was written about this work. And it really appealed to me intellectually and clinically. And I had no idea at that point what my journey would be because it ended up resulting in an implementation at Calgary Counseling Center, but also my going back to school to do a PhD. But the journey and implementation has been the hardest thing I've ever done, but also probably the most rewarding and the most interesting work of it. So, well, tell us about that. So you, you really created a, a culture there that I think is unusual in most agencies. So we did a pilot in 2002, and that ran till about early 2004. We had the staff use different measures, and we, we compared at that point the OQ and the outcome rating scale. And we had our teams divided into two, and half of them used the OQ, and the other half used the ORS. Hmm. And then after six months, they switched. And um, so they used the other measure. And, and kind of about 14 months, at, at about the 14-month point, we, being very Canadian, had people sat down and I said, so what do you think about this? Do you think we should try it? Do you think it's worthwhile? And people voted to use the OQ and the longer form SRS. Um, today, as an administrator, I would do my research. I would make the decision about what, which tool most suited our organization and would implement using that and just share that with the staff that this is a decision we'd made organizationally. Mm -hmm. But the staff seemed very keen and gave us initially the impression that they were all very keen and wanted to do it. And then when we, we started implementing September um, 2004, we kind of looked at the data about a year later, and this was all manual. You know, we're doing it in Excel. We were only tracking first and last session scores of, uh, with both measures. And uh, it kind of looked like we had a really good amount of data kind of um, in 2006. But as we got deeper into the analysis in 2007 and 8, we discovered that only 40% of the staff had actually offered the OQ to their clients. People were kind of saying they were doing it, but they were really not keen to do it. And they were really afraid of what they were learned. They were afraid that we would use it for, for performance management, meaning that their raises and their progress in their careers would be impacted by this. They really didn't believe the clients were going to be truthful. They thought that these, these things were useless and weren't going to help us achieve some of what we thought were the objectives at the time. So I heard probably every excuse possible not to use the measures. So I had to make probably one of the toughest decisions I've ever made. And as, a, as an administrator, I had to let everybody know that, that in September 2008, this was no longer optional, um, that using the OQ was part of their job, that this would never be, and it never was, a performance metric at our organization, but the performance metric was going to be the percentage of your clients that actually use the OQ. And that they had to offer it to clients in such a way that increased the likelihood that the clients would do it. Now, remember, I'm still a clinician. I, and I remember the old days when I first started working with a one-way mirror and I could go into a room and ask clients for, for permission to have a team behind the mirror and ensure that they'd say no, because I didn't like who was behind the mirror. Or I could ask in a way where I would be almost 100% certain they said yes. And kind of that's what I was talking about. And our philosophy was that client, and still is, the clients have the right to say no. But as a member of this team and as a member of this organization, you had a responsibility to ensure to ensure that it was offered to a client in a way that increased the likelihood of their participation. Well, 
after we did that, people seemed to kind of say they would do it. And between uh, September and December, 40% of our staff left. And I will never forget the day that our now director of counseling walked into the office um, and she said to me, Robbie, how do you know this is the right thing to do? And I said, everything I've ever learned and everything in my soul tells me that we're on track to do this because it's giving clients a voice in what's happening. It's giving us a way of understanding whether we're making progress or not. And um, it just, to me, I just don't, I think we'd be making a mistake if we stopped this right now. And we're still together today, she and I, managing a team now that's almost four times the size that it was in 2008, because this, the process involved in implementation and the process involved in the creating the culture has allowed us to create a really strong cohesive team mm -hmm. and um and um achieve what we're now calling breakthrough results wow. the whole process for us is totally transparent there are no secrets in what we're doing so clients get to see their results look now it's automated so um, when they press done on the tablet and it's available in 17 first languages, the graph comes out of the printer and we sh you're expected to share it with your client. If the client wants to take it home, great. Nothing makes me more excited than to see clients in the elevators holding their graphs. It tells me they're engaged um, in the process when they want to take it home with them. Um, and we initially um, didn't do any um didn't really produce any serious stats with this the focus really was on engaging the counselors and doing the work helping them understand how to use the scores how we're going to focus on clients that weren't progressing and our focus in supervision and in our consultations is really about um, the non-progressing client and we only started producing stats and graphs when this counselor started asking for them. And when we run data, even today, when we're doing something new, we actually run the data blind. So if we're looking at variances amongst clinicians, we look at the data blind because we don't wanna know who the people are. It's much harder to make good decisions mm -hmm. if you're thinking about the people right than if you, if you know who they are. So what's happened is we would present the data blind and the counselors would say, can we see our own? And I, we, I would say, are you ready for that? And what are you gonna do if the results aren't what you're hoping they're going to be? And we would have those discussions for a couple of weeks before we would actually share some reports. And we'd always share the reports in a meeting with all the counselors together so that people could talk about them. We put them up on the screen if somebody wanted. And we kind of built a series of reports for the counselors based on their growing interest and curiosity. Mm -hmm. So every counselor now, every three months, um, gets a report that shows them their prog the progress of their clients in that, uh, it's actually we do it every four months, in that trimester. And then the second trimester of the year has eight months. And then the year end report shows the whole year. So there now some of them are saying, okay, I wanna look at my report from last year to see if I made any progress. So they're looking, at the, they're looking at their clients to see the percentage of clients that are in those four categories. We produce their effect sizes. Uh, we look at the number of single session clients that they've had and we compare it to our average as well as the average that the research talks about. Um, and we're striving to do better, but we're not pushing to do better. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, so I'm struck with how you've created it. It sounds like a sense of safety to do this, and, and, and then along with that, then built curiosity so that yeah. people really want to dig in and, 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 and explore what it means yeah. to them and their work. Yeah, I think that's happened, so, but I didn't set out to do it deliberately. Like now I'm trying to describe, I'm going to be writing about this in the next year or so. I'm trying to describe how we did this. And it's actually, 
it probably was more intuitive than it was um, deliberate in those days. And now I think we want to write it up so that we can help others who are wanting to do some of this within their own agencies. Mm -hmm. We're just so excited because we're developing, I would say, a more authentic relationships with our clients as evidenced by some of our experience using the session writing skill, using the Alliance tool, and also using the outcomes tool and having clients give us feedback about what's working for them and what's not working for them. And using that to inform practice. So it's not about us. It's really about helping the clients get the results they're looking for. And everybody in our agency now uses that as their mantra. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I very much appreciate your time. I, I, I know people are going to be inspired by, by the lessons you've learned and are able to pass on. My pleasure. In this interview, Dr. Babins Wagner has described building a culture in which the client's voice is actively sought and used in both treatment and supervision. But of course, each institution or agency has its own context. And what she did with her agency won't necessarily work in departments of behavioral health. So please discuss how you might, if you were an administrator, begin building a culture in which this would work in your own agency. 